Jewish some other time. But uh, anyway, Paul Kretzen was uh, working together with, with George for many years, and they remained very good friends. And I think it's somewhat of a surprise uh, to Paul that George showed up today. George spends half of the year in Carmel and half of the year in Stockholm, or maybe some other places, I'm not sure. <laughs> I first met Paul in 1968. I first, I first met Paul in, sorry, in 1975 when Paul came to uh, Colorado. He was a senior scientist at that point and then shortly after became the head of what we call the Air Quality Division of NCAR. People who don't know, this is the National Center for Atmospheric Research of the United States. In 1980, Paul returned to, to Germany to Europe and became a member of the Max Planck Society and for the advance, advancement of science and the director of the Atmospheric Chemistry Division of the Max Planck Institute in Mainz, a position he held until the year 2000 when he retired. During all these years, Paul spent Many year, in many international uh, committees, editorial boards of various uh, scientific uh, journals. For example, he became a member of the German Parliament Committee for the Protection of the Earth the Atmosphere, something that is very much related to what we are talking about today. He was a reviewing editor of Science Magazine, and so on and so forth. Many, many, many other committees. Uh, his relation to Israel is uh, in two, two folds. First of all, he is uh, also a member of the board of, the, of uh, governors of the Weizmann Institute, and he is a member of the honorary board of the International Raoul Wallenberg Foundation uh, in Jerusalem, uh, a fellow of the Literary and Historical Society of University of Dublin, and so on and so on and so on. I mean, the list is as long, and I don't want to bother you and to take away from his talk. Paul has about 300 publications, and uh, I cannot obviously name all of them, but I think for us scientists it's, it's rather impressive. Paul received a number of prizes, including 14 honorary doctor's degree from different places around the world. He received the Leo C Siller, Leo Sillard, I guess, prize for physics in the public interest from the American Physical Society, recipient of the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement for his work on the chemistry of the stratosphere, received the Volvo Prize for Environmental Studies. He is a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, a recipient of the German Environment Prize Federal Foundation for the Environment. Uh, in 1993, he was a visitor here at Tel Aviv University as part of the Sackler Distinguished Lectures in Geophysics, Atmospheric Sciences, and Planetary Sciences. He is a recipient of the Max Planck uh, Prize, together with Dr. Malina, which will come back in two minutes. Then, in 1995, he took a break. The break was to receive his Nobel Laureate. And he received it for him, together with uh, uh, Molina and Roland from the U.S., for their work on atmospheric chemistry, particularly concerning the formation and the composition of ozone. In, uh, in 2000, he received the honorary member of the Swedish Meteorological Society, and also that year, Time magazine named him the hero of the planet a special edition that was published that year. He is an honorary member of many societies, and I won't bother you with that. He is a recipient of the United Nations Environment Protection uh, and the WMO uh, Commission on uh, this WMO is the World Meteorological Organization uh, in a convention that took place in Vienna. He was awarded then. He was awarded a number of other uh, a number of other awards for various, from various organizations and various institutions around the world. He's a fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences from San Francisco in the U.S. Now, with all these honors, Paul remained humble, informal, and friendly to both colleagues and students. Now, I don't know if I can 
show this, I have one picture here that we work together on one of the doesn't show up <laughs> ah yeah okay this is a uh, to show you the informality of Paul this is a uh, we had an experiment in 2001 in Crete and Paul was uh, actually one of the leaders of the of the of this particular campaign and uh, just to show you Paul and some of the colleagues and students all in the most informal way that we can present them. Paul is a good friend of our university and we agreed, he agreed today for example, to help us in, by serving on the International Board of the Porter School for the Environmental Studies. I am sure that Paul's reputation and energy will help us promote the school not only in Israel but will help to make it a focal point in the international scene. Now, Paul's main interest, uh, even though he is retired, he is still very active in science, and his main interests remain in atmospheric chemistry and the role it plays in climate and biogeochemical cycles. In 1970, Paul was among the first to investigate what was called, at that time, in the 70s, not in, what was called nuclear winter, which has a direct relevance to some of the things that Paul is going to talk to us today. And the talk today, I guess, will be something that Paul, I think, was named, and named as a climate engineering. So we are very happy to have Paul with us today. And uh, before I ask Paul to give a talk, I would like our, our vice rector to say a few words, please. That's it. So, okay. Well, sorry for this uh, mishap, but uh, I thank you very much for, for all the introductions and, and, and so on. And, um, yeah, uh, very nice to be here with good old friends, and I hope we make new friends. We, I met two ladies who are very supportive. Of, the Porter Center. It's very nice to, to have met you and to see your enthusiasm for for the center, uh, for the school, I should better say. Um, so uh, you see a new term here, Anthropocene. We geologically we no longer live in the Holocene. I think because of human activities, which I will uh, show a few examples of, we are beyond. Uh, mankind is now really affecting the composition of the atmosphere and the changes on, at the land surface, the biology of the earth in very many ways and uh, in strong ways and it's uh, actually uh, increasing. 
Now I must push the right button. This is... Can you tell me which one to take? <laughs> because if you go wrong sometimes with this... No, the purpose of this was this. So just the mouse. Okay. See? Oh! What should I? How far we can go? Try to delete. <laughs> Try now. How is it now? Do you still a problem? Maybe hmm. it's off. Oh no! Now you hear. Right now? Yeah? Do you hear me now? Okay. Well, normally I speak loud. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have. Tell me, please, if it's impossible, then we have to do something about it. But am, am I now hearable? It's still a problem. Hmm. Can you give me the thing in your pocket? Let me see what you have. Maybe it's not on. it's on. It's on. Try now. Try to speak now. Hello? Is, is it now okay? All right. Good. So, uh, I created a new term, and that is Anthropocene, because mankind is uh, really affecting the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, changes at the Earth's surface, the biology of the Earth, biogeochemical cycles, climate, in, in all sorts of ways we are affecting uh, our environment and also on the global change, not only on, on the re local or regional scale. So, uh, and to give you a few examples, uh, during the past three centuries, uh, mankind in, in has tenfold in numbers. So we have now, t uh, uh, at the moment we have more than six billion people in the world and it has grown by a factor of 10 over the last three months, three years, sorry, three, three uh, centuries, and then uh, uh, it's continuing uh, in this way. Other changes, cattle population increased uh, to about 140 million people, or cattle. Um, 1,400 million cattle uh, is a lot. I mean, that means basically for each family around the world, there is one cow supplying us with milk and cheese and steaks. Uh, it's quite impressive and they eat a lot. And by doing that they also create a trace gas in the atmosphere and that is methane. And methane is a greenhouse gas which uh, helps in keeping the, uh, the earth warm. But also uh, it's a, a gas which, inf uh, which influences the chemistry of the stratosphere and the troposphere. Urbanization grew more than tenfold in the past century. Almost half of the people in the world now live in cities, in megacities, and especially in developing nations this is the case. Um, industrial output increased 40 times during the past century and energy use 16 times. And almost 50% of the Earth's uh, continents, land surface, has been transformed by human action. Water use increased ninefold during the past century to about 800 cubic meter per capita, of which 65% is used for irrigation, 25% for industry, and 10% for households. So we're really affecting the uh, composition, the, the, the hydrological cycle. And to show you some drastic examples of that, it takes about 20,000 liter of water to grow one kilo of coffee. So that's a huge amount. 11,000 liters of water to make a quarter pounder. 5,000 liters of water to make one kilo of cheese. So you may not have been aware of that, but these are big numbers. And no wonder that we, the earth is running dry. Human appropriation of net primary productivity also has grown 
uh, substantially uh, during uh, the past centuries or decades and about 30% it is estimated of the net primary productivity which uh, nature supplies with us is now being used in some ways and that's uh, of course growing. Uh, fish catch increased 40 times and uh, this uh, overfishing is a problem. The release of sulfur dioxide which actually uh, I have a number 160 million ton a teragram, uh, 160 teragram per year, that's no longer valid, it's now 110 because uh, the emissions of sulfur dioxide to the atmosphere over the last decades has gone down quite considerably and that is, uh, is in connection with the acid rain problem over the Amer America and also over Europe. So it's 110 teragram of sulfur dioxide per year but it's by coal and uh, oil burning but it's still at least twice the sum of all natural emissions of sulfur into the atmosphere and over land the increase has been uh, sixfold. So uh, that has caused acid rain, health effects, poor visibility and climate change due, due to climate to sulfate aerosol which I will return to. Releases of NO to the atmosphere has increased from fossil fuel and biomass burning is larger than the natural inputs causing high surface ozone levels over extensive regions of the globe and we all know our summertime photo photochemical smog situation especially in America and Europe uh, is, is a major problem. Several climatically important tr greenhouse gases have substantially increased in the atmosphere for instance carbon dioxide by more than 30 percent and methane by more than 100 percent. They play a role in the chemistry of the atmosphere and also in climate. And we see uh, also that especially after the Second World War the uh, uh, input of human activities on the atmosphere has grown uh, very steeply and it's continuing because now the developing countries want to be, get into the game. So we see here examples of that. I won't mention all of them but you see the population increase. You see uh, the uh, uh, gross national product, gross domestic product, foreign direct, direct investment, uh, the damming of rivers is a major activity we are, we are involved in and uh, of course that plays a role in uh, hydrology of the earth. Um, so water use increase, fertilizer consumption, then uh, the urban population you've seen going, going down or going up and then uh, paper consumption is, has been growing quite considerably. Uh, that is not all negative but uh, it all has of course effects because something has to happen with this paper and it will uh, possibly end up in landfills where it is then producing methane because landfills uh, work uh, under anaerobic conditions and carbon is then emitted to a large degree uh, as methane in, in the atmosphere. Uh, we uh, should not forget the McDonald's in the States. Uh, you see the rise of uh, the McDonald's and uh, so um, and we can go on like that. Uh, there are many more other, more other examples. Humanity is also responsible for the presence of many toxic substances in, in the world. And not only uh, toxic substances, but also <coughs> some, some uh, which uh, do not affect uh, the, directly the health of people, but uh, they are nevertheless uh, have created major problems with the ozone layer and these are the chlorofluorocarbons which uh, fortunately are no longer produced but it will take about 50 years before the uh, ozone hole which I will briefly come back to before that will have been uh, have, have gone, uh, repaired itself. Uh, so these uh, and that causes uh, for instance ultraviolet radiation increases, skin cancer but also effects on the biosphere on plankton for instance. And then we have species extinction. It, we probably have a species extinction between 100 to 1000 times larger than natural species extinction which was uh, one species extin extinction per year per million 
uh, pieces. It's now a hundred to a thousand times larger than that. So that's very worrisome. We continue like this. And then uh, we have also evolutionary changes that are taking place in many species, especially in commercially important pests and disease organisms through antibiotica and pesticides. This accelerated evolution cost at least $33 billion to a year in the United States. So this is some, something we are normally not aware of. Erosion, we keep changing the surface of the Earth. It's, uh, one example, of course, is the Tel Aviv, or Israel as a whole, where you see everywhere you see building going on. And uh, that means that uh, man caused erosion by crop tillage or land conversion or for, for grazing and construction is about 15 times larger than natural. And at the current pace, anthrop anthropogenic soil erosion would fill the Grand Canyon in about 50 years. And it's spe speeding up here. The nitrogen input into the earth and into the atmosphere uh, bypassed the, the natural, by, by human activities, that's the lower curve, bypassed the natural nitrogen fixation uh, since 1980. So we uh, are putting more nitrogen as fertilizers and also as in form of air pollution by automobiles in the atmosphere than uh, was naturally the case. So, uh, and uh, of this, much of that it has to do with agriculture. And uh, it's quite uh, amazing to maybe realize that of the nitrogen which we uh, produce uh, which by nitrogen fixation, only about 5% is keeping in our mouths directly. The rest goes first to cattle who then eat, and then we eat the meat and, and drink the milk, and so to say. So uh, it's, uh, in that sense, not very efficient what we are doing. The composition of the atmosphere we don't have to worry about the major constituents like nitrogen, oxygen and argon. Their concentrations, if you add them up, is almost 100%. So we atmospheric scientists and chemists, we don't worry so much about these gases. We leave that to be a, to the, ge the chem geo geologist uh, to worry about. Uh, we, c we cannot, uh, in foreseeable time, say of the order of a million years, we cannot affect the oxygen uh, and certainly not the nitrogen content of the atmosphere. But this, uh, they don't add up to really 100% because there are minor constituents like com carbon dioxide, CO2 in the atmosphere. Now it's a level of about 380 parts per million and it's increasing with a rate of about 0.4% per year. So, uh, and that is causing changes in our climate because uh, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. I come back to that. Then we have, but carbon dioxide does not affect the chemistry of the atmosphere directly. It's rather inert in the, in the atmosphere, once it's in the atmosphere. But if we have to go down to uh, describe the chemistry of the atmosphere to compounds with much lower concentrations like methane, of which we have about 100, 1.8 parts per million in the atmosphere. It has gone up since I wrote down uh, the 1.7 uh, number. At the moment, methane is not increasing in the atmosphere. It is uh, uh, stable at the moment, but that may be just temporarily, uh, a thing which I'll briefly discuss also. Let me, uh, methane is affecting the chemistry of the atmosphere. Uh, I can't go into details, but uh, in, in major ways, also in the stratosphere. Uh, and um, a very important gas in the atmosphere is ozone. It has very variable concentrations in the atmosphere, in the vertical. At the ground level, we may have about a mixing ratio of 10 to the minus 8 at ground level, except if we have photochemical smog episodes, then this can go up by a factor of 10. But uh, on the whole, uh, we, we have most ozone is uh, located in the stratosphere, or about 90%, 10% is located in the troposphere. <laughs> and is important for the chemistry of the atmosphere, troposphere, as well, of course, in the stratosphere where most of it is located. Um, it's decreasing in the stratosphere, it's increasing in the troposphere. Um, nitrous oxide, N2O, laughing gas, is not a gas to la la 
uh, laugh about. It has a concentration in the atmosphere which is about 0.32 parts per million. You see the numbers have gone up since I made this slide. And it's increasing by about 0.25% per year. So it's a steady increase which has been taking place since the beginning of the 19th century. So it's a forerunner of the nitrogen oxides in the stratosphere and in that way indirectly controls the amount of ozone in the atmosphere. And then we have the CFC gases at concentrations which are less than 10 to the minus 9, but despite the low concentrations, they are responsible for causing the ozone hole and ozone depletions uh, in, 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 in the atmosphere. Maybe the two most impressive curves showing you the uh, changes which mankind has imposed on the atmosphere are the car it's carbon dioxide. Hmm. Ah, here it is. You see the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the years since the end of the 50s. You see the seasonal variations in carbon dioxide because it's involved in the photosynthesis process, but you also see a steady rise with about 0.4% per year, which has been going on since a long time. That's, uh, and we know, of course, why this is happening. And then we have the ozone hole, something which we did not expect at all. No scientist predicted the, the ozone hole. It was simply discovered by uh, measurements uh, over the Antarctic where our British colleagues discovered that hey, in the month of o October, it's the springtime season in, in, the northern, in, in, in the southern hemisphere, ozone was going down, total ozone starting with about, from about 3 millimeter of ozone, if you take all ozone in the vertical, you get 3 millimeter, it was the natural situation, and what you see instead is that we have now levels of uh, o total ozone which even are beyond about one millimeter. So by a factor of three, the amount of to total amount of ozone over the Antarctic has decreased by a factor of three. And this was not predicted. It was also found out where it was really happening. It was hap happening in the region of the atmosphere where normally, and we are now looking at the height level and ozone concentration as a function of height, uh, in August, just after the polar winter in the southern hemisphere, we saw this maximum. Two, be two months later, you see that this maximum has been converted in zero. There's no ozone. This is uh, what we call the ozone hole. Uh, the worst effects of the input of CFC gases in the atmosphere is happening over Antarctica, the furthest away where we emit the CFCs into the atmosphere. So this is a remarkable thing. And it tells you that uh, maybe if we now extrapolate to climate issues, maybe the climate models and uh, current knowledge of uh, climate physics and chemistry uh, is actually uh, will turn out to be much worse than we think at the moment in climate change. So this is a lesson, firstly, uh, that scientists cannot predict everything and that things can be worse than we might predict at a particular time. Something about uh, why the atmosphere is doing all of this to us. Uh, if we look at the balance, the, the radiation energy balance of the atmosphere, we get about, on average, about 340 watt per square meter. Oh, here you see it. 340 watt per square meter from the sun average over the Earth, 340 watt per square meter. Let's call that 100 units. Then of these 100 units, uh, 30 or almost 30 units, 28 units are scattered back to space. That's the Earth's albedo. That's some backscattering of solar radiation at the top of clouds, but also on aerosol particles, small particles, which also due to human activities can be brought into the atmosphere. Then there is absorption in the atmosphere, and finally what comes down to the Earth's surface are 47 units, a little less than 50% and half. The Earth has to get rid of these uh, 47 units, otherwise the, the Earth would be cooking in, in a question of a year. The, the, the oceans would be, uh, um, would be 
be evaporating and uh, so the earth has to get rid of the 49 units and it does it in very clever ways. Firstly, 24 units are given off uh, in the form of latent heat, evaporation at the ground and condensation in the atmosphere and then so also we have heat con con conduction in the atmosphere, uh, about 5 units. That's 29 units. We needed to get rid of 47 units, still 18 units in some way the Earth has to get rid of. And it does this in the infrared by uh, emitting not just 18 units, but by emitting 114 units, of which then 96 units are coming back from the atmosphere. The species in the atmosphere, the gases, are water vapor, of course also involved in cloud processes, which makes it, the description of climate very difficult, but also we see clearly the effect of carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, N2O, the chlorofluorocarbon gases, they all add to the greenhouse effect. So the Earth is a very efficient recycler of, and the atmosphere, a very efficient recycler of this energy because of the 18 units, these 18 units are not, go, not going back. In fact, what is going up is 140, 196 are coming back. So six times before the four, 18 units are emitted to space, it has been recycled between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere some six to seven times. And we depend on that. It's the greenhouse effect. And we see an uh, increase in temperatures around the globe, the global average temperatures. There was already a period earlier when we had an increase in the 20s to 40s in temperatures. This may have to do with uh, uh, some solar activity it may have played a role uh, there, but also internal um, uncertainties uh, or internal feedbacks within uh, the Earth atmosphere system. Uh, then we had a period when uh, temperatures uh, went down slightly. This may have had to do with the increase of particles in the atmosphere. This, this was the time of industrialization since the Second World War. And now we see that we have a very rapid rise in temperatures, global air, air temperatures, which uh, I think this year will be even further up there, uh, which is uh, telling us that something is happening to our climate and we don't have a good explanation for this except that it is due to our emissions of greenhouse gases and in, into the atmosphere. So to look at what are the factors then which, which determine the climate of the earth, we have the uh, greenhouse effect, here we have the greenhouse gases listed, there global warming radiator forcing is if you also add in tropospheric ozone, it's almost 3 watt per square meter. That's what we get, an increase in the radiated balance of the Earth. Uh, the in in imbalance is of the order of 3 watt per square meter. But they all, it's not only the greenhouse gases which uh, play a role in climate, they're also the particles the, uh, which uh, play a role. They're, the uncertainties are very big. These particles can serve as uh, cloud condensation nuclei affect the, the albedo of the clouds and the albedo of the Earth uh, and uh, can by themselves also scatter back solar radiation to space. So they have a cooling effect except for uh, some of the mineral dust or uh, the uh, soot, black carbon which is uh, emitted into the atmosphere. But you see that all these factors, the blue area where, where you depend on small particles in the atmosphere and solar, solar uh, reflection of solar radiation on the top of clouds, they are all very uncertain. So there's a huge amount of research still to be done to understand that part of the climate system. I think the infrared, the global warming part by the greenhouse gases, I think there's very little uh, discussion about that anymore. We can try to uh, estimate uh, the, the, the various terms in uh, the radiation balance of the Earth. We get 340 watt per square meter from the sun. I already mentioned that. Uh, the uh, greenhouse gas forcing, which we talk about since pre-industrial time, is a small number com compared to the 340 watt per square meter. It's 2.7 watt per square meter. But still, that's enough 
to heat up the earth and the atmosphere. Now let's see what happens, uh, what other factors play a role. Of these 2.7 watt per square meter, about 0.3 watt per square meter is taken up by, taken up by the ocean. They take heat from the atmosphere and store it long term uh, in the surface ocean, o ocean layers. Temperatures have increased by about 0.6 degrees uh, in the atmosphere and that leads by itself to an increased escape of uh, radiation in the form of heat radiation uh, to space which we estimate is of the order of one watt per square meter. This is work I did together with uh, Ramanathan. So one of the 2.7 watt per square meter, 1.3 watt per square meter are taken care of, but still we lack 1.4 watt per square meter to get the, radi the energy balance. And uh, our feeling is that this 1.4 watt per square meter is really the albedo effect by additional input of particles in the atmosphere and their effects on clouds. We cannot prove that, but we have a closed budget. That would mean that 50% of the greenhouse force of the 2.7 watt per square meter is annihilated by, uh, by the uh, uh, increased albedo effect. So by so only half of the potential heating of our climate is made possible by, um, by, by uh, the greenhouse gases. So um, this is important to know because we have really a dilemma situation because the, the particles which do this, and the, the 1.4 watt per square meter, that's basically air pollution. The air pollution saves us from otherwise large, harsher uh, warming of our climate by maybe a factor of two, if you believe these numbers. So it's really showing a dilemma. On the one hand, we want to make, to clear the atmosphere. On the other hand, uh, by doing that, our climate might get warmer. So what can we do about it? I will come back to that. Put a little sulfur in the stratosphere, maybe that will help. But I, I come back to that. These numbers which I also wanted to point out is that uh, the uh, greenhouse gas forcing is 2.7 watt per square meter. The heat release by the burning of fossil fuel into the atmosphere, just the heat release, is only uh, 0.025 watt per square meter. So only 1% of the greenhouse warming is coming from the heat release in the atmosphere. So it's really the recycling, or it is six to seven times recycling between atmosphere and Earth, which is causing uh, the greenhouse effect and warming of our climate. We get more heat from, from the Earth, actually, than from uh, the burning, in, burning of fossil fuels. It's almost three, a little more than three times more we get just by heat from the in, inner regions of the Earth. So it's not the heating by the burning which is causing the, heat, the warming of the atmosphere. It's the heating by the greenhouse effect and by the optical properties of the greenhouse gases. So uh, we have estimates by models. Uh, we cannot really predict the future just by predicting it. We, we can only do it by running models and uh, the results of these models cal calculations uh, are shown here. It's uh, uh, the, the balance of that was from a report in. Let's read the second re the report in of the inter intergovernmental panel for climate change in 2001. Stated there is new and stronger evidence that most of the warming observed over the last 50 years is attributable to human activities. Uh, and estimated at that time was that the average global temperature rise is between 1.4 and 5.8 degrees Celsius to, towards the end of this century. That's what the range of modern calculations indicated. It's a very large range indicating uncertainties in the science, but also in human behavior, because we don't know what our, what we, uh, we may know what we are doing, but are not always aware of it. But, uh, um, but, uh, the future will be determined by our children and grandchildren. And how they will behave, uh, we don't know. Whether they, they want more oil burning or less oil burning and so on. 
So uh, that the uncertainty is, is big, and um, I think in the current uh, intergovernmental climate panel of climate change, it has, the range has been reduced, but I haven't seen the report. Maybe some of you have and can fill in what the current uh, numbers are. So other problems is sea level rise. As a Dutchman, I should be very much aware of that. Shouldn't happen. It's a nice country. And uh, there are other things we have to worry about. Redistribution of precipitation, enhanced risk for extreme weather, like uh, this fall has been the warmest fall since uh, record records in over Europe. Three degrees Celsius above normal. Uh, then uh, increase in heat waves. So we had the one in 2003 or four, of course, in Europe. And two rapid climate changes so that ecosystems cannot adapt. So what, can, what should, can we prevent it? Well, in principle, we can prevent it. Uh, for instance, by not releasing so much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But the task is enormous. To, reduce, to reach a steady state, no longer an increase in temperatures around the world. Uh, stabilization, no, the stabilization of human-made emissions uh, would require, in the case of carbon dioxide uh, reduction, by more than 60 percent. And that's a lot. Uh, many countries, and, and basically the question is, is this at all possible? Um, the, uh, and that is not count, not count, uh, I mean, if you consider the future, we have uh, the, the, the rise of the economies of, of uh, the Asian countries, China, India, which will add more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Already at the end, in a few years, uh, the input of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere by China will be bigger than, than that from of the United States, so, which is the leader at the moment. We have methane. Uh, you could say, because it's no longer, at the moment, not increasing in the atmosphere anymore, you could say that, it has, uh, that we have reached uh, the maximum in uh, emissions, but that is not taking into account the possible thawing of the permafrost regions. In, over Canada, Canada and Russia, there are large permafrost regions, which, because of heating uh, of uh, the globe, uh, may start m melting. And if that happens, uh, then the carbon dioxide, the carbon which is in the permafrost region through warming, can lead to large emissions of CO2 and especially methane into the atmosphere. So this is a possibility which we uh, should watch. Car nitrous oxide, again, enormous task to uh, reach steady state in the emissions, a reduction by 70 to 80 percent. Much of this N2O emission has to do with nitrogen fertilizer with agricultural productivity. So a huge task, questionable whether we can reach that task. Fortunately, we have two cases which uh, makes us a little optimistic, and that is the uh, CFC gases. They are no longer produced. They're phased out since about 10 years. Slowly we see that the increase in these gases uh, is going back. So we have a slight decrease in the gases concentration of the CFC gases in the atmosphere. But it will take uh, sort of 50 years before the ozone hole will have gone. And you see here the main contributors to the release of CO2 to the atmosphere in metric tons per capita per year. And North America is leading. We are doing somewhat better, but still uh, we have the whole range of developing countries which are in per capita putting, putting much less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than the developed countries do. So this will be a main, one of the main problems. How can we uh, prevent the further grow up, growing of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, with uh, actors like in Asia uh, coming into play? Will be, one, one is not very optimistic that uh, this can <coughs> succeed. We cannot uh, think that nature in some they help us out, that when temperatures go up, maybe uh, nature will emit less CO2 or methane into the atmosphere. No, the op opposite is the case. Any time when in the past we saw an increase in temperatures, be in ice cores you know, over 
Antarctica. Every time this happened, also carbon dioxide went up in the atmosphere and also methane went up in the atmosphere. So the Milankovic cycles are explaining this behavior, but then reinforced by the emissions of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere by purely natural process. So uh, doesn't look very good. The main effect is over the polar regions and especially in the northern hemisphere where a doubling of CO2 may give rise to increases in temperatures by uh, 4 to 8 degrees Celsius. So it's a major until the poor doubling of CO2 which may be reached by the end of this century. So uh, there's, there's no peanuts. So this is uh, Especially the Arctic Ocean seem to be uh, rather unstable with regard to the uh, ice cover. The Arctic Ocean's uh, ice cover is about 40% thinner now than it was 20 to 40 years ago. And there's dramatic climate change happening in the Arctic about two to three times the pace for the whole globe. So this may then cause this permafrost melting which then further accelerates the emissions of methane and CO2 to the atmosphere and warming of the globe. Can we do something about it? And I'm now coming to uh, briefly to uh, the sulfur experiment, yes. In the first place, however, we should try to uh, reduce the emissions of the greenhouse gases as much as we can. And through energy savings, renewable energy, nuclear energy, wind or solar energy, and CO2 sequestration, where you bury the CO2 underground or in, in submarine uh, areas. But if that cannot be done, and so unfortunately we cannot be very op optimistic that uh, we can achieve a uh, re strong reduction of carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere, we might have to think about other means. And that's why I came to think about the possibility of uh, of putting a little bit of sulfur in the stratosphere, a million ton per year. Still only a few percent of what we put in at ground level. I won't go into the details of... Um, I'd better go to... Uh, uh, this, this was a study I published in, in August this year and it has to, uh, really caused lots of discussion. And that's good because uh, I don't want to be involved in stupid things, of course. So, uh, but we have uh, tried with, es with models to estimate what uh, might be the what we might achieve by putting uh, one teragram of sulfur into the atmosphere. And this is work I did together with Phil Rush and also with Debbie Coleman at the uh, uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research. What we basically do is uh, we, we, we take the best model which is available and do games with the model. And I don't want to uh, go into the details of the models. Uh, this is more for, for the experts, but it's a general circulation model which has been developed at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And then we perturb, uh, we do calculation. Uh, by the way, I should say that this idea of putting sulfur in the stratosphere is not mine. It goes back to a Russian scientist Udiko in 1977. So uh, I just, that, but um, with, has never been checked with models, with current models, uh, this idea. And uh, also Epper Teller uh, uh, was thinking about it, and then some of his uh, younger colleagues, Kovin Sama and Caldera, did some very early calculations on that. But uh, the first calculations using a model I did with. Uh, Field Russian colleagues. So, again, some more details about the model we have. Uh, uh, the model describes uh, atmospheric phenomena between the ground and about 80 kilometers altitude with two kilometer height steps. And uh, it also has uh, the best physics uh, at the moment available. It doesn't have any biogeochemical cycles. So, this feedback through the uh, uh, through the release of carbon dioxide and methane in the permafrost regions is not included, the possibility in the models. 
So, we have sulfur chemistry, we put sulfur into the atmosphere and we need sulfur chemistry because what we put in is H2S and SO2, but they are converted into the stratosphere. Uh, sulfate particles which then scatter back solar radiation to space. That's the whole idea. You form a little layer of sulfate in the stratosphere which then reflects some of the solar radiation back to space and it cools the planet. So, uh, details about the models. Uh, we also have oceans. Some transport in the, uh, in the oceans is allowed for, but uh, so uptake of temper of heat in the ocean from the atmosphere is uh, part of this model. So what do we do? We uh, make four simulations. Firstly, we fix the aerosol and greenhouse gas forcing at present day value. This is what, what the, the control case. Then we do some calculation in which we artificially, in the model, double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that leads to a warming. We can also put one million ton of sulfur per year, SSO2, between about 25 kilometers, at about 25 kilometers between 10 degrees north and 10 degrees south. So that then creates sulfate particles and backscatter of solar radiation, the cooling. And then you do both. And let's look at uh, the results. Here you see if you only in, in double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. These are global average temperatures which are calculated in the model. You see we start at about 288 Kelvin, 15 degrees Celsius, and then we get an increase in temperatures. We have the time scale here. So after about 20 years, we have come up uh, to a heating of uh, the Earth, uh, the atmosphere temperatures at the, in the Earth's surface by a little over 2 degrees Celsius. This model is, has a low response to carbon dioxide inputs. There are other models which have much larger uh, effects. If you uh, just put one teragram of one teragram of sulfur into the atmosphere, it gets colder, and you see how the temperature curve goes then. You have a cooling of, uh, at the Earth's surface by a little over 2 degrees Celsius. And then if you do both, then you get this black line here. You're almost back to natural conditions in temperatures. Looks uh, quite impressive. And of course, if you can tune it so you put in a little more sulfate and we could, you know, the black line would come to be, but that would be uh, cheating, I guess. Also, uh, annual average uh, precipitation, very important factor, has the same features. Uh, the carbon dioxide doubling gives the heating, gives more evaporation at the Earth's surface and more precipitation. Uh, sulfate input will cool the, pla the planet, so there will be less evaporation and uh, cold, colder and less evaporation. And you do both, you get uh, b the black cu curve, which is very close to it. It's, an, it's hard to see, but it's a bluish curve here, which is the, the natural situation, the control case. And you see we're almost straight on with precipitation, worldwide precipitation. Um, I won't go with because of time, but the residence time of the sulfur in the atmosphere is normally com uh, said to be between one and two years. Actually, in this model, we get three to four years, which indicates that we can work with much less um, sulfur input in the atmosphere than otherwise would be the case. I go over quickly a few slides. The, the optical depth by this experiment, uh, if we uh, do the C doubling of CO2, uh, no, only the... Uh, um, if we do, do the, the sulfate input, only that, the uh, optical depth um, is of the order of uh, 6% in equatorial regions going up to about 10% at higher latitudes. So the, the sky will get a little whiter, but it, on the other hand we will get a wonderful sunset and sunrise. Because basically I'm imitating what the, what the volcano is doing. And uh, if we do the doubling, both doubling and uh, sulfate input, we have similar optical depth, uh, which the model calculates. Precipitation changes, they're summarized here. You, s you see that uh, most of the area is white. That means that we are 
in these areas we are back to normal, to the control phase. Except in a few points, but look, the scale has changed because we were earlier talking about 2.5 millimeter uh, precipitation. Now we have of the order of 0.25 millimeter of precipitation. So uh, reduction by a uh, factor of 10 now compared to the uh, other case we are looking at. So maybe some of this variability is also uh, due to just statistical uncertainties. But uh, you see, we don't, we haven't affected the precipitation field dramatically. It's we are back to normal conditions by this experiment. Temperatures at the Earth's surface. <coughs> this is what the model calculates: as annual average sur surface temperatures for two times the control minus two times CO2 minus the control case. The changes from the control case, and you see that uh, we have uh, heating up to four degrees. Uh, in, uh, over the Arctic regions, we, I already showed it in an earlier picture, and also over the Antarctic regions. With the, sol with the input of SO2 in the atmosphere or sulfate particles, you see we are almost everywhere white. We are back to normal. So, it's not totally true, because if you look at it a little bit from the point of view of, uh, of, of, of uh, Temporal resolution, you see that in winter time, December, January, February, the high latitude increase in temperatures is still there, and that simply has to do with the fact there is no sunlight there. We are in the polar night here, and the aerosol will not be affected. But as soon as uh, in, in the summertime, you see this heating is, is gone. So we have a almost normal uh, situation. I think here, we, this model has been checked by uh, simulating uh, um, volcanic eruptions, like Pinatubo, which uh, erupted in, um, in 1991, and uh, data are available, satellite was up uh, to measure changes in atmospheric composition and changes at the ground, and in, on the whole, the model which was used here, uh, performed very well in describing the, uh, the climate of uh, the volcanic eruption. So, um, you would almost say Sim Salabim, we solved the problem, but it's not so simple, because what I wanted to show here is, in the first place, it looks so good that I, I'm a little worried that some circles will immediately propose to do this experiment. I would be very much against it. I'm for studying the effects, but I'm not necessarily for uh, doing the experiment, because we have to look, of course, at all side effects. Ozone depletion is one of them. Maybe we have simplified the precipitation patterns too much. Maybe if we get better and better models, it won't look so good. But at the moment, uh, it looks like a very interesting possibility to maybe, in the worst case, when temperature changes will go beyond what we expect at the moment, and I refer back to the ozone hole where we did not predict the right damage at all. Maybe there's a similar ozone cli a similar climate hole somewhere here in which it turns out in the future that things are much worse. We cannot exclude that, and if that indeed is the case, then maybe we are forced to do an experiment like this. If sea level rise is faster than predicted. And, uh, of course, there are ethical problems involved with this. There may be international political problems involved with this. Maybe uh, for a doubling of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, some countries may profit of this, like Russia or Canada. Other countries will suffer, like the Netherlands or Bangladesh. Who is going to organize that in the future? It will be very uh, important, but uh, discussions going on. So I would like to stop here, and uh, thank you for for your attention. Okay, uh, we, will allow, we will allow a few questions. Yes, please. I have a question not to be taken too seriously, probably a very stupid one. If you inject so much sulfur in the atmosphere, uh, what do you do with the acid rain huh? problem? Uh, you increase it a little bit, but only by a few percent. Because we put, I, I showed this on one of the slides, we put about uh, um, 
50 million ton of sulfur already into the atmosphere. I think it's actually 70 million ton of sulfur. So we add one to it. So it will add a few percent to the acid rain. So but that's. You have to repeat it every two years. Yeah, yeah, but we put uh, uh, 70 million ton of sulfur into the atmosphere anyhow, by in the chimneys. So that's also repeated every year. <laughs> but I mean, it has to be repeated. And again, it is a, maybe a temporal s solution because maybe in the m meanwhile, uh, the uh, energy systems will have become much more favorable so we don't put in so much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And, uh, yeah. And we can also sequestration may have become very successful and, and uh, can be uh, paid for. So it's, uh, it's not the solution, it's one of the possible solutions which is added to other uh, me measures. Any other questions? <coughs> yes? Well, well, I, uh, airplanes would not be a very efficient way because then you put the sulfur near the tropopause, and that's where we don't want the sulfur. You can form cirrus clouds, and if that is the case, you warm the climate. So that's actually even under the simulation which I did. This is something which is not really included in the model how the sulfur input in the stratosphere might affect the sulfur comes down to the top of the troposphere, the cirrus cloud formation. That's, you can say about that uh, much more. What so. about the ozone chemistry in the stratosphere? Yeah, the ozone result? chemistry we should carefully look at. Uh, I've looked at it. I don't think it will be a very serious problem. There will be an effect. But you always have to compare the positive with the negative effects. And if reality, as I showed here, would turn to be uh, right, then I think uh, the, the positive effects will f uh, really overwhelm the negative effects in the case of ozone depletion. Any other question? Yes. yes. The peanut pupil effect on this line was very, very positive. We had a lot of rain. Yeah. So, Tripping, not down, but No, I have not seen that, but uh, it's an important thing. It's one of those things we have to check on, of course. Thank you. I will show later on that Israel appears in the, the one point in this particular model. Yeah, maybe you should do, if you want more rain in Israel, maybe you, do, you should do the experiment. <laughs> yeah, one more question I'll take there. One second, Michael, if you have. No, this is a very good question. That's the worry, of, of course, we have about it. But uh, um, we, we have to watch it. If, if, if even if politicians will build on this and um, tell their, uh, their population to... Uh, we, we can go on uh, as, as long as we can do. That's, of course, a criminal act. It's really... Uh, in the first place, we should bring down the emissions of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But if the next generations of politicians and the general public is stupid enough or selfish enough not to work on reductions of the emissions, then it's a pure crime. And what can you do about that? Yeah, that's... Uh, but on the other hand, uh, People were going to look into this. It, uh, we cannot say, I mean, for a long time I was totally up, uh, opposed to, to do these sort of, even think about this sort of experiment. But I changed mind when I saw how little action really 
has been taking place on the front of, uh, of the reduction of greenhouse gases. So that's why I basically wrote the paper. It's, you, what you do is, uh, the experiments to bring so much sulfur in the stratosphere by rockets or so, there was a question about it. It's not a nice experiment, it's rather grotesque. But it would show the politicians what they really are doing to counteract what they, they not have been doing. Uh, you need such uh, grotesque uh, operations. Yes, ma'am. I don't know, it's, uh, it's not my field, but uh, at the moment there are just very small plots where some experiments are done in the North Sea and so on. But the real bigger experiments are still far ahead, uh, maybe 10 years from now. And then the question is how practical will it be to do that and what will be the expenses. And lots of things like that have to be worked out. I should also mention that uh, the sulfur experiment by itself is not, not enough because there's another problem by increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. We acidify the top layers of the ocean, which can lead to uh, ecological problems there, the dissolving of the calcareous uh, organisms. Yes, Mr. Baker? No, but yeah. No, it, it, we have to collaborate worldwide on this. So the the next inter, it should be part of the intergovernmental panel for climate change uh, reports in the future. We can only discuss it if, if we do it country by country. There will be uh, suspicion, um, of course, and. Th this is, is an issue which should be covered internationally at the same time and the only way uh, of, of, from all countries. And the, the only way to do it is to make it part of the intergovernmental uh, panel for climate change discussion. So we get up scientific updates. Because the, the experiment, I should also clarify, which I'm talking about, is not something we should do within the next 10 years, I'm sure not. Oh. Excuse me, we will have to run to another one more question. Yes. We have to finish the, the discussion. Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, the universal law for Murphy's law, for the Oops factor. Um, have you run worst case scenarios about nuclear winter? You know, the worst case that can happen here. Oh, yeah. Oops, I missed something out of the equation. But by what I mean, because nuclear winter is clear. Uh, I think even newer, newer model calculations reconfirm what we said 20 years ago, that uh, uh, all-out nuclear war between the West and the East at that time would lead to... Uh, no, I don't mean that. I meant cooling of the Earth way beyond what it can, uh, what it can hold. In other words, the model goes totally wrong. Okay. In other words, then you can, we did the experiment and whoops, we didn't realize yeah. this. Yeah, but that is, then that's the advantage of doing the, the, the seeding experiment. Because as soon as you stop the seeding, then one year later you are back to normal conditions, one or a few years later. And so you return to uh, normal conditions, at least from the heat budget uh, point of view. Okay, we'll have to stop now because we have a long evening.
Thank you Hello. Good evening. Uh, my name is Chagit Messer Yaron. It's a great honor to be here tonight. I'm now the Vice President for Research and Development in this university, but it was a great honor for me to be the head of the Porter School of Environmental Studies uh, just before. And uh, uh, I was told that you didn't get the opening notes of Udi. Hi. Udi Mnayau, the current head of the school, please. Thank you, Pagit. What a pleasure talking right after you. Uh, our esteemed visitors, Professor Kutzen, uh, Dame Shirley Porter, Ms. Yeni Strum, ladies and gentlemen, as head of the Porter School of Environmental Studies, I am delighted to welcome you all here today. I would like to say a few words about the special structure of the school, the PSES, that allows us to put on events such uh, today's conference. The school is a unique type of school, not only a Tel Aviv University, but also uh, in Israel. We work with all faculties and disciplines at the university here at Tel Aviv across hard and soft sciences, promoting multidisciplinary view of the environment. We also collaborate with other universities and research institutes in Israel. We believe that this approach is vital for providing solution to today's environmental issues. Our new graduate program, which started just a few months ago, offering a second degree and PhD degrees, also adopts this multidisciplinary approach as the students can undertake their environmental research from whichever disciplines they choose with access to all of the university's faculty, departments, and facilities. Our multidisciplinary outlook is reflected in today's conference program. As you will see, we have not been limited to any specific aspect of climate change, but have brought many elements together under one roof. If we were not limited for time, we would gladly bring together more speakers and cover other disciplines. I hope that we will find the opportunity uh, for those. The topic of today's conference is one, if not the most pressing environmental issue facing us today. It is a global issue which is relevant to all of us. At the PSES, we aim to tackle environmental problems that are of high priority nationally, regionally, and internationally. It is therefore fitting that much of our work at the PSES deals with the different aspects of global climate change and related topics, and I am delighted that we have been able to bring together this expertise, as well as the invaluable contribution of Professor Kruzen. To debate this issue in a public setting, like we are doing today, I would like to use this opportunity and thank the staff of the PSES. Everybody was working extremely hard during the last months organizing this symposium. This includes Arye, Eli Galanti, Smadar, Shula, Tami, and Elia, and all of them really deserve a lot of thanks. 
So I will end up here and wish all of us an interesting continuation and fruitful uh, symposium here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Udi. Um, after having a novel, or maybe we'll say Nobel view of the topic, uh, we'll move to our local speakers. And in this session, which is called uh, the Global and Local Climate Change, we have uh, three and a half speakers, all of them from here, from Tel Aviv University. Um, but they will talk globally, as you will see. Uh, I'm very happy to invite the first speaker, Professor uh, Colin Price from the Department of uh, Geophysics and Planetary Sciences. Uh, my job is to keep the time, Colin, so I'll do that. I was asked to talk about the science of global warming, and uh, unlike Al Gore last night and Professor Crutzen, I only have 15 minutes. So I'm going to try to make uh, the point quickly and convince you, and by, in doing this I'd like to make a comparison between the Earth and the human body. We all know that the human body has a, stand, a fairly stable temperature of 36, 37 degrees Celsius, and all of us know when our body temperature, from our own experience, increases by one degree, two degrees, we found ourselves with fever, lying in bed, two degrees, we can even be in hospital. And it affects our mood, we get fairly agitated, a little irritable. In fact, even in this room when we're hot, we're getting a little irritable here. Well, the same is happening with the Earth. The Earth has a fever, and uh, unlike the human body, the Earth's temperature is about 15 degrees. So we're going to first talk about the diagnosis of the problem. The Earth's temperature... The average temperature is 15 degrees, unlike the human body, which is 36 degrees. And what we see here, and we've seen this before, yesterday and today, are the actual observations of the temperature, of the, the thermometer of the, the globe, the temperature averaged over every spot on the globe from 1880 to 2000, 2005. In fact, this was updated to last year, which was the warmest record, the warmest year on record um, since we started measuring Th uh, temperature with thermometers. The black dots represent the annual temperature. The red line is the five-year running mean. And these green bars represent our uncertainty in the measurement. We don't have measurements everywhere around the planet, especially over the oceans. And the further back we go, the more uncertain we are. But what we see is the zero here is the average temperature between 1950 and 1980. And we see the change in temperature, uh, 0.4 degree cooling before and up to about 0.6 warming, degree warming now. Over the last 100 years, we're close to a 1 degree warming of the Earth. Same as with the body. If we increase our body temperature, we have a fever, 1 degree. A 1 degree increase in the Earth's temperature can also start affecting the behavior of the Earth, weather patterns, hurricanes, tornadoes in London perhaps, uh, a month without rainfall in Israel, um, many other factors which may be related to the fever of the Earth. Um, and that's part of the research to see whether it is related or not. But if you don't believe the temperatures, we can just go outside. You can go for a walk around the world, and wherever you go, you'll see the retreating of glaciers. We saw this as well in the film last night. 99% of the world's mountain glaciers are retreating. They're disappearing. We can see the difference between 1900 and 2000. This is just a 13-year difference, 1951 to 64. And you can bring another 10, 15 images, the same. And this is obviously getting warmer. The temperatures are warmer, even if our long-term global temperature um, is, has problems. Why doesn't this go forward each time? Well, 100 years isn't very long. We have to check the patient, uh, the Earth. So let's go back even further in time. Let's go back 1,000 years. So here we have today, 2,000, going back 1,000 years. And obviously, we don't have thermometers more than 100, 200 years, but we have what we call proxies, 
which can be tree rings, um, um, corals. I didn't do anything. It's not on the screen. The shalak? Escape always works. So we can use um, tree rings, corals, um, sediments, pollen in lakes, and we can go back in time and estimate the temperature of the Earth relative to today. Again, zero is more or less the 1950 to 1980 temperatures. And what we see is actually in the last thousand years, there was, and this gray envelope is again our uncertainty. The further back we go, the more uncertain we are. There was actually a slight cooling of the Earth until about 200 years ago. And then we can see this dramatic rise in temperature. In the last area in the red is what we've actually measured with thermometers. And we can see that the last 50 years even have been the warmest temperatures we've ever seen, at least for a thousand years and maybe longer. And 1998 was, was the warmest year together. Well, maybe 2005 was. We have two more weeks to this year, and 2006 will be third in position after 2005 and, 19, and 1998 for the warmest years on record, at least in the last thousand years. Well, if we want to look at the diagnosis of the planet, we have to bring in more data, not just look at the fever of the planet. And here again, we've heard about this, the greenhouse gases, which have been increasing. And here the scale again is 1,000 years back in time. How do we get this data? We look at the bubbles inside ice cores. Ice cores in Greenland, in Antarctica, Again, the bubbles, the air which is trapped in the ice has the concentration of these pollutants which was included in the ice at the time that the snow fell and the ice formed. And we see that in carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide were fairly stable for nearly a thousand years. No change in the concentrations and all of them started to shoot up about 200 years ago. Carbon dioxide has increased by about 32% in the last 200 years. Uh, methane, 133%, and uh, nitrous oxide, about 20%. Well, let's collect some more data. And this is world population. This is 10,000 years of the population of the Earth, going back from today, AC, BC, Stone Age. And what we see is that for most of the Earth's history, the population of the Earth has been below half a billion. And again, 200 years ago, it shot up to, this has to be updated, this is five and a half billion, it's now over six billion, and the projections are from the United Nations are perhaps to double the population again by the end of the century. What happened over here, we all know what happened, that was the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution, we started to have steam engines, motor cars, produce electricity, farming, um, <coughs> fertilizers, instead of just farming for our families, we can start having big farms and farm for whole countries, whole cities, and increased medicines, better lifestyle. People started to live longer, and so slow, very quickly we added many people to the planet. Well, let's go back even further, and we saw this as well. We can go back now. This is a graph of 420,000 years. Zero is here, 420,000 years. And we can actually go back 600,000 years so we can update this graph. And what we see is the changes, and we saw this in Professor Crutzen's talk, the changes in carbon dioxide as we go back in time, the changes in methane, and the changes in the temperature of the Earth. The temperatures are measured using chemical isotopes, so it's a relative temperature from today. Today's temperature is zero, so this is a two-degree warming and a four-degree cooling. And again, what we see is a very good positive correlation between high values of, of these greenhouse gases, what we call greenhouse gases because they act similar to a greenhouse trapping the heat in the earth, and warmer periods of the earth's history. And lower concentrations of these gases are very well correlated to the cooler periods, what we call the ice ages. Here, 20,000 years ago, there was two kilometers of ice sitting on top of New York City. And that was from only a four degree warming a four degree cooling. So a, a cooling of four degrees resulted in a two kilometers of ice over North America. And what we're talking about today is perhaps the same warming but in the opposite direction. Well, if we add now the last 100 and 
or 200 years to the end of this graph, the scale is different now. This is in hundreds of thousands of years. We can now add what we see in the atmosphere. The blue curve is now the modern-day carbon dioxide, and the green curve is the modern-day methane. Uh, based on this scale. We can see it's off the scale all the way up here. The temperatures haven't seemed to increase that much at the moment, and that may be actually worrying. The question is, what's going to happen to the temperatures? How high are they going to get? One of the reasons we may not have seen this warming yet is we heard in the previous talk clouds and aerosol particles may actually be reflecting a lot of the sunlight and cooling the planet. But the oceans, the, the oceans also have a lagging effect, that the oceans absorb a lot of this heat in the, in the trace gases, and it may take decades to even centuries for the system to reach equilibrium. So even if we stop today all the increase in gre greenhouse gases, we may still have one or two degrees warming within the system. That's the diagnosis. So the Earth does have a fever, and I think I've proved that. The question is, what's the prognosis now for the future? And here we have to take out our crystal ball and look into the future. And our scientists call this crystal ball a climate model, where we put on all the, the information we know about the climate system and try to predict what happens in the future. First, we have to try to predict what happens today and in the past. And so what we have on the top here, from 1880 to the present, are various factors which can either warm or cool the climate. If it's a positive number, it means it warms the climate. If it's a negative number, it will cool the climate. And what we have is this red curve, which is the observations of increase in greenhouse gases, which we know warm the climate. We have other factors like this purple line, which are actually particles, and little um, particles in cloud um, albedo, we call the brightness of clouds, which cool the climate. So it actually has a ne negative number. It may be increasing with time. We also have volcanoes, which we heard about. This blue curve is this dramatic cooling of the Earth after we have a, um, a volcano and lasts for a few years. But then when these particles settle out of the atmosphere, it returns back to normal. We also have the sun, which has an 11-year periodicity and other factors. When we put this all into our model, what we get is this uh, bold black curve, which is the simulation of the climate from 1880 to the, to the present. And on top of that, we have the actual observations with the, with the stars. And we can see that the models do a fairly good job. We're putting in all the information we know, they actually can simulate the climate fairly well. These dips, are again, are related to volcanic eruptions. And uh, our models aren't perfect. There are uncertainties, and they may not be 100% um, be correct, but they're the best tools we have. And if we trust them, then let's look what may happen in the future. So using all the models we have, and there may be 30 to 50 different models around the globe, all the models show that if we keep on going the way we're going, we're going to have a warming, a global warming over another one degree at minimum and maybe up to a four to five degree maximum by the end of the century. And there's no reason to stop here. This is just the end of the century. It will obviously keep on going um, with time. If we have a global warming of four degrees, basically we'll be living on a different planet. The planet Earth will be a different, have a different climate, different weather to what we know today. It will be a very different place. One degree warming we may be able to live with. And it's likely it will fall somewhere in between here. Uh, this is, again, the uncertainty between the different models. Another two things that all the models show is that with a global warming, we have increase in sea level. Sea level is increasing mainly due to the warmer water. Warmer water takes up a larger volume. There's also melting of snow and ice, but that's a minor factor at the moment. It may be a major factor in the future. But sea level is going to increase, and we already see it increasing. And precipitation, which is a major factor, is just going to change. We don't really know which way. It's going to be drier in some areas, and it's going to be wetter in other areas. We may have flooding in some regions, droughts for extended periods in other areas. And these three parameters have direct implications on all different areas of our life, from health, for example, malaria, which is a tropical disease, which is related to temperature distributions, precipitation, um, air pollution in the summer, uh, ozone levels in the summer, are directly related to the temperature of the air. So if we have heat waves, it's likely to be more um, air pollution. Agriculture, obviously, uh, rainfall, pests, droughts have a direct effect on agriculture. Many nations in the world, especially the third world, rely mainly on rainfall for irrigation. Forests um, 
will have, may have to migrate, may suffer, we may have in, intensified fires in forests, um, also pests which can attack forests. Water resources are maybe one of the major focuses in Israel, the quality of water, amount of water, competition between countries for water. Coastal areas, increase in sea level will have direct effect on erosion, various uh, um, species, which is also related to biodiversity here at the end. So this is the prog prognosis. Well, what's the medication and the treatment for the planet? So there's some things we can do in the long term. The long-term treatment, medication, the short-term treatment, and there's the problem if we have to take the earth to the emergency room to intensive care, um, what we just heard about. Long term, we have to dramatically decrease greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and that's related to the Kyoto Agreement, which most countries have signed on to except the main polluter, which is the United States and Australia. Um, we need to move to renewable sources of energy, wind energy, solar, hydrogen, nuclear, which may return, it's still a dirty word today, hydroelectric power. In Denmark, more than 30% of the electricity comes from wind power at the moment. Reduction in deforestation. We didn't talk much about this, but the biosphere, the vegetation on the planet, through photosynthesis actually absorbs some of these pollutants. A lot of the carbon dioxide is absorbed into plants and is stored in a carbon bank in the trunks of the trees, in the leaves, in the branches. And uh, at the moment, we're chopping down these forests. We're changing forests to agriculture. We're changing the type of biomass we have. But we're not just chopping it down and making furniture. We're burning it to clean the areas. And so all the carbon in those trees is being released as carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And about 30% of the increase in carbon dioxide is caused by changes in the biosphere due to deforestation and other changes. So this is what we have to do in the long term, really, if we want to stabilize it. In the short term, we want to, to buy some time to find some solution. Um, we can definitely increase energy efficiency in power plants, in cars, at home. The technology is available. Power plants are basically about 30% efficient today, but it costs money to change the turbines in the power plants, so you need some investment, government policies. Increase use of of natural gas. Natural gas is also produces greenhouse gases, but is less pollutant than coal and gasoline. So this is, will give us some time to find long-term solutions. And again, in emergency, we, the, the thing we're really worried about with global warming are surprises, things that we don't expect. As though you're walking along a table blindfolded, we don't know when we're coming to the end of the table. And these could be, we heard about the permafrost in high latitudes, which if the permafrost, which is frozen, comes above zero degrees, we can have a massive release of methane into the atmosphere and a massive warming of the planet, a break-off of a large piece of the Ant Antarctic ice sheet and falling into the ocean will produce a huge tsunami around the globe. We don't know if this will occur or not. And there are other um, doomsday scenarios which we hopefully will won't occur, but that may bring us to the emergency case that if we do see some rapid changes, we could maybe use geoengineering as a final resort to treat the fever of the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, we'll have some time at the end for a discussion, but uh, thank you for having The next speaker is uh, Dr. Marcelo Steinberg. Department of Planet Science, and he will talk about uh, ecological aspects of climate and land use changes. local, so I knew how to turn off the lights on time. And, well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm pleased to be here with you today. Um, the top of my presentation, the title is ecological. Well, first of all, I have to change the accent from South African to Spanish one. Uh, and I apologize for that. 
Uh, second, well, the title of the, my presentation, the ecological aspect of uh, climate change and land use. And the question is if we are, our world is in peril. And I can say, well, straightforward, yes. So I can finish here my lecture and just uh, go home. But I would like to present you why we can support this, this straight answer. And um, we know from the, the composition of the atmosphere that the main a change in the quality and the composition of the atmosphere was done by plants uh, millions of years ago and was the main change of the, the main uh, contamination of the atmosphere uh, millions of years ago. And now uh, that was done by many, many species. Now we know that only one species is uh, responsible for this important change. And we're talking only one species, us. Uh, we also know that the world is uh, crowded and calling has shown some nice slides as well. I have also some elements on that. Uh, we know that the human population has been increasing since the first humans were around, uh, around uh, 190,000 uh, millions a years, a thousand years ago, and we are we are here around at the moment, and uh, we can we don't know where we may reach with the current uh, growth rates, this actual effect of the reduction in death and mortality, the main point here of the increasing of human population. And if we look on a shorter part, in the closer period of time, we know that around the, our population is about uh, six uh, and a half billion people, and we are here at the moment, and the projections that we're uh, in a very short period of time we will increase significantly our population. And uh, in only four generations, four generations in human history, this nothing, just a second. So if we compare with the total of 7,800 7, generations since human creation, in four times, in four generations, we almost increased by 7 million the current population. 7 billion, 7 billion. that's 7,000 million. So we know that also the, our ecosystems that are producing services. They are giving us the air that we respire. We are, they, are, they are actually having the climate regulation at the moment. They relate the nutrients and the pollutants, and they are producing us, uh, providing foods, natural resources, as well as recreation. These are the services we're getting from the natural systems. By burning fossil fossil. Uh, fuels, we are actually what we call the greenhouse sources. That's mainly the production and effect of humans getting <coughs> new carbon into the atmosphere. And as well, not less important, by changing the land use. The land use surface is with a picture of an area that has been deforested in Madagascar, where actually these areas are sink of the, uh, the greenhouse gases and we're changing these things to get these uh, gases, and as well changing the landscapes of the whole world, from Argentina, where we're coming from, to uh, Namibia, and as well not only land use, but also oceans. We are also, the ocean is a very important sink of uh, CO2, and we are changing all over the world the quality of the ocean, and we are changing as well the activities there. And just getting into how the knowledge uh, of the global warming gets in, we have to make some short history as well on the ideas of rebel and getting this uh, very well known graphic now where measuring of CO2 on the Mauna Loa. And from his first paper in Telus in 57, getting to the idea of the first idea of a correlation between CO2 and global warming. And then we cannot Let's uh, re refer the work of Brecker when the, in the first paper in 1975, the first science, the first presentation of global warming in science, and from there up to the last week paper from David Tillman in science on measuring, measuring the, the use of uh, uh, natural grasslands to us producing biofuels and uh, keeping high biodiversity. So we did in these 50, more than 50 years, quite a knowledge on what's going on. And we know what we are doing, more or less. And we know, we may expect the, the effects 
that will happen. Uh, Dr. Pachuri, in just a month ago, in the last meeting in Nairobi of the IPCC, just uh, gave some uh, new elements of the world temperatures changes on the Greenland uh, ice mass changes as well. I'm going to put it here. And the deficit of, uh, of uh, ice that we are getting and the level of the rising level of the oceans. So these are elements that we know and the rate of these changes are every year increasing. Unsurprising as a scientist that we see the rate increase. We know as well the, the melting of the glaciers in all of the world, it's not only in the poles, but also in Argentina and as well in Switzerland. So we can see the changes in the polar arc. And another type of similar graphic that Colin just showed, the effect of the three elements of high interest temperatures, extreme weather on the rise level, having extreme effects on biodiversity, diseases, starvation, changes in the coastal level, and as well as water scarcity. And that's an element that relates us as, as well. Uh, I'm going to show you part of the three findings that the Millennium Assessment, you may have heard, the, the meeting uh, of the scientists of the world and see how to try to get an idea of what's going on in our system uh, just from last year. And they came out with three main findings. One, first of all, is that over the 50 years, the humans have changed the ecosystems more rapidly and extensively than any comparable period in human, in human history. It has resulted in substantial and largely irreversible loss in, in diversity life on the Earth. This is one of the main findings. As well, when you look on changes in species diversity, and this is the list of the threatened species from the UCN from this year, and we look on the total uh, percentage of uh, life on the, on the Earth, about 10% of the life Earth organisms are threatened and they are endangered and in risk of extinction. If you look mainly on the uh, amphibians with very high proportion, more than 31% of risk of complete extinction. We have looked on unprecedented changes on our ecosystems, uh, as Professor Kunzen uh, showed us later on. Before that, the main changes on, on the Earth uh, on water use, on changes in water quality, changes in coral reef, and the amount of uh, pumping and over-pumping of water, uh, a resource that is not renewable. So we have to consider these elements, and definitely the Dead Sea from our region on the mismanagement of, uh, of the whole area has been leading to the disappearance of half of our Dead Sea. When we talk about deforestation, as well, we see the, the problems of changing the land. Land use changes. This is a picture from the Mato Grosso area in Brazil. And as well, the piles of these cuttings and all the, all the trees that are getting out from the system. When we look on changes on, on land use, we have to change, consider the changes from crop, cropland expansion, deforestation, and in only three years, three years' time, more than 44,000 kilometers of area has been converted. This is twice, twice the area of Israel in only three years of the forest that disappeared in only one part of Brazil. It's not considered here Ocean, Ocean, Oceania, uh, the oceanic area, which is much, much, much drastic area. When you look on, on, as well on surface temperatures, this we, we see a clear trend on increasing uh, global surface temperatures. And we see as well a uh, changing in the this is the increase of uh, temperature, and we see a changes as well from some uh, paper from, uh, from last uh, two months ago, where a, a potential reduction of phyto phytoplankton, which is actually the ones who is absorbing the CO2, a reduction, a clear reduction of these, uh, these organisms in the sea, which actually they're reducing the potential of uh, incorporating CO2 into the, into the ocean. And coral reefs, the tropical forests of the oceans, are indeed suffering of the, the phenomenon of a bleaching, losing the socks and tails, the organisms that are symbiotic, and they are using, uh, getting into the, the, the energy into the, uh, into the corals and the completely bleaching and disappearance of these elements. And if we look on changes in the vegetation, 
and we look on particular areas like this one, you get here a simulation of changes on land cover and latent changes in the vegetation with the melting of the glacier areas through time. And this is based on real data. And the modeling shows us the disappearance and changes of the vegetation while going on in time. Until uh, also the important changes in the flowering timing. We see here data from 100 years when we see uh, in uh, early flowering of all plants in the area here in the Boston University and comparing the data. And we, got, we heard about as well of the melting of the permafrost and release of methane, which is five times more effective as a greenhouse than CO2. And this is something you have to consider. The final number two is changing in the, with the, main, the human had men on the land surfaces uh, by changing on uh, in different ecosystems and the changes that, the, that may affect the future generations. Uh, the last one is that the degradation of the ecosystem services could grow significantly worse during the half of the first century. So, and we are, we are seeing these changes all over. And just getting a local view as well, we have to consider as well, we live here, what we know, the, the, our systems, they predict for our system change in temperature and rainfall. And uh, within that, there's a, a study going on, a cooperation between Germans and Israelis uh, on looking on the vulnerability of, uh, of the, uh, our systems to climate change. And we use uh, the uh, steep climatic gradient we have in Israel to see uh, potential changes on vegetation land cover and as well on the other elements of uh, ecosystem functioning. And just uh, two days ago, we get this simulation of scenarios for vegetation for our region uh, from uh, Martin Koki from Potsdam University uh, our colleague, and we make a simulation of changes in cover considering the, uh, the data from the last uh, 30 years and the projections for the next uh, uh, 50 years, more than, well, the one, 171 to, uh, to, to, one, to 100, and we see changes in cover in our region. These changes indicate a decreasing of plant cover, an increasing of aridity going from the desert, the desert going up north, and uh, this will be transformed as well in a potential change of carrying capacity of our systems. What it means a reduction, for example, just taking into consideration one element, the stocking rates from our area for cattle grazing or for sheep grazing, we will expect to reduce. And we see that from our simulations. And that's the scenarios we have to build for our future. Uh, some elements, very few elements on land use, we know that Part of the area, the, the area of uh, the the area of North Tel Aviv, and the part, the northern part of the of the country is mainly used by urban, and uh, this area has been transformed. Uh, these elements are getting that well combining with the population growth of our region. Uh, but now we, we are at about 6.2 million in the 70. In in 2020 we expect 7 7.3. While in the Palestinian Authority, we expect about 508 million people. By the, the year 2020, we expect to have 13 million people in very short area. This is a very short area. At, sorry, but by 2020, it's 18 million. So it's, it's quite crowded here. And this will definitely <coughs> lead to an increase of land use, land demand, and as well, pressure into natural ecosystems. So we have to develop scenarios where we have to consider the linking the ecosystems, linking land use and climate change based on the assumption of all these elements combined. And uh, it is indeed not an easy task, but it's something we have to do that for the future generations. From a denial, what we heard for many years, that global warming is not happening, and for the final recognition that, well, it's happening, but doesn't care, we don't be here when we happen, we have to, from denial, to recognition, and from recognition, we have to go to action. This is indeed something we have to do. Thank you very much.
now is sitting here and before me the chairperson of the previous session. So whenever I sit, I need to move to you. <laughs> so 15 minutes there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we heard today about uh, the effect of global warming on different things based on various models and various uh, measurements that have been carried out around the world. One of the things that you probably noticed that precipitation was not uh, ex you know, extensively measured or mentioned, sorry. And the reason it was not mentioned is because precipitation is a very difficult thing to measure and it's extremely very difficult to, measure, to, to calculate or to model or to forecast. And I called here the, the talk, the paradox of the effect of air pollution on, on rain is because I'll try to show you that we think we understand what is happening in the clouds, but when we try to understand what's happening on the ground, uh, the answer is not clear. So this problem of the effect of pollution on precipitation uh, was recognized by the World Meteorological Organization as one of the issues that we have to deal with. Uh, because precipitation is affected both by meteorology, which means the temperature, the amount of vapor in the atmosphere, the convection, the flow, and so forth, but also by the number or the concentration of on the chemistry of the particles that are floating in the atmosphere. And since we don't understand what are the What's the history, what the history tells us about the effect of pollution and precipitation, the World Meteorological Organization formed a special group to assess, to understand what do we know, what we don't know about the effect of precipitation, uh, of uh, pollution on precipitation. So let me just briefly illustrate what we think we understand about what's happening in the cloud. We understand that if we have water vapor and we have air that is lifted in the atmosphere, clouds are going to be formed. And if the cloud is very clean, if the atmosphere is very clean, we are going to get the same, to distribute the same amount of water on very few droplets. And these droplets, because they are large, they can collect each other very effectively, and consequently we will have quite a lot of rain. However, what happens when we introduce pollution into the clouds? The same amount of water, now we have to distribute over many, many cloud droplets. And these cloud droplets are smaller, Consequently, they are going to have longer time for precipitation to develop. Very often, these clouds are going to evaporate, and in the long shot, we are going to get less rain on the ground. That's what we understand. Now, we talked about global models. Global models are a very interesting tool to use, and here are some examples of some global models. There are a few of them. You can see each bar here represents one global model. And you can see the variation in the, in the results. And if you look at, the, for example, the total precipitation on the ground, the global average, we see as a result of increase in, in pollution, we, within 100 years, we're going to get about minus 4% in precipitation. If you want to, to separate between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, you find that some of the models show you that you have a decrease in precipitation of about 12%. Uh, Some actually show you even an increase in precipitation. Some will actually show you an increase in precipitation. But you can see the variation between the different models. Now, what is the problem with the model? The model shows us basically a decrease, so we have to, indeed, we have to worry. The only problem with these models is their resolution is about 200 kilometers. And if you live in Israel and somebody tells you that you are going to have less rain within about 200 kilometers around you, then you wonder that 200 kilometers is more rain in Syria and less rain in Tel Aviv or vice versa. 100, 100 kilometer shift in the, in the position of the precipitation to air to countries small like Israel or Holland or something like this can be all the difference in the world. So these models are maybe good to give us an indication but certainly are not good to give us an idea of what's going to happen in a specific place over the, num over the years ahead. Now, in order to do this, we decided not to look at global models, but rather to look at, first of all, to understand the process on a small scale. 
And this is a small scale, which is one cloud. We are looking at one cloud and how the cloud is going to behave when we put more pollution into it. And I showed you at the beginning what the concept tells us, more pollution, less precipitation, and that's what we see here. This is the amount of pollution, if you want, and this is the total precipitation. And if you increase it, let's say, by a factor of five, you decrease it by about a factor of five or six. You know, as the precipitation will decrease as a result of increase in pollution. Very good. This is what the concept tells us. Now, let's see what the observations tell us. Well, the observations tell us, for example, this is what we call ship tracks. Uh, if you have a very thin cloud over the ocean and a ship moves underneath and releases certain particles into the air, if you look from, the, from above, from the satellite, you will see this kind of, this kind of lines. You have to look with a certain wavelength, otherwise you won't see it, because the whole area is covered with cloud. And what you actually see here is certain regions where the cloud droplets are smaller. Cloud droplets, smaller cloud drops, reflect more effectively radiation back to space. So when you look with a certain wavelength at these particular clouds, you actually see the signs or the marks where the ship went through. So what does it tell us? It tells us that if you put pollution into the cloud, you are going to produce smaller cloud droplets. Okay, great. That's, we understood this. This was one of our elements. There was another study also looking at cloud is in Australia, looking at pollution coming out from a certain region. And if you look at all this area here, suggesting that the cloud droplets are smaller. And if you look at some of these areas, they suggest that there are some precipitation falling. Uh, but in this region, we do not see the precipitation. There are some arguments. Uh, not everybody agrees with the kind of uh, analysis of this particular case. But still, we do know that these clouds have smaller droplets, which means pollution produces less, I mean, smaller, smaller droplets. Okay, this was what happens in the cloud. Now let's see what happens on the ground. Based on what I told you before, the conceptual model tell us, tells us we're going to have less rain on the ground. Well, this is the measurements that was done in, uh, analysis that was done in Australia. Downwind of sugar cane, where they burn the sugar cane, where they burn the sugar cane. And you can see over the years from 1910 to 1960, the amount of sugar cane burning is increasing. And long and behold, precipitation seems to be following similar trend, which means a decrease in precipitation. This paper appeared in 1968, and everybody was happy because we seemed to understand. Two years later, Jack Warner, who did this work, wrote another paper and said, we are not exactly understand, we do not exactly understand what's happening because it's possible that some of the meteorological parameters could have explained this kind of behavior. So at least the, the trend that we see here agree with our conceptual model, but there are some questions about it. Then there was a, a case in downwind of, uh, of St. Louis. St. Louis, downwind of St. Louis, there was actually an increase in precipitation over the years, not a decrease. So the scientists went and they started flying through these clouds, measured the cloud droplets, and indeed the cloud droplets were smaller. Most of the measurements suggested that there should have been a decrease in the amount of rain on the ground. But, lo and behold, precipitation increases. So we do not yet understand what, the, what is the link between what's happening in the cloud to what's happening on the ground. More recently, there was a paper by the group from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem that argued that over the western slopes of mountains, this downwind of certain pollution sources like cities, you're going to get an increase, I'm oh, sorry, a decrease in precipitation over the upwind side. You know, the wind comes from this direction over the mountains and produces rain in this area. Sometimes it produces rain on top and sometimes produces rain on the other side. According to them, there's a decrease in rain on the upwind side and slightly increase on the other side. Now, we, we do not 100% agree with this kind of analysis, but the interesting thing here is telling us that pollution may not change by much the total precipitation, but it may change the distribution of rain. 
Well, the changing of the distribution of rain for a country like Israel, as I pointed out before, is, can, can be a major disaster. Instead of raining here, it may rain in Syria or in Lebanon or who knows where. 100 kilometers, the global model doesn't, doesn't, is not able to resolve. So here is a summary of some of the measures, some of the examples. Some of them I gave you, some of them I did not mention. But you see, in Western Australia, due to the uh, burning of sugar cane, you get a decrease in rain. The St. Louis increase. La Porta is another interesting. It's downwind of, of Chicago. And for many years, there was a sh small area where there was an increase in precipitation. So they went and studied it. They couldn't figure out exactly what it was. They thought maybe some of the steel mills in uh, Chicago are releasing certain particles which help increase the precipitation. And long and behold, in about 1960, all of a sudden, the decrease disappeared. So they don't, still do not understand what is the, the, this increase coming from. There's a paper, uh, paper mill in Washington State showed an increase downwind of the paper mill. In orographic, I just showed you, seems to be an decrease on the upslope, an increase downwind. Uh, uh, in New York and Houston, very recent study shows no correlation between pollution and the amount of precipitation on the ground. Sometimes it increases, sometimes it decreases. In the Amazon region, some of the pollution, we are actually from the MADEX project, this is the Israeli astronaut experiment. We took some photographs showing that they, actually the pollution from the burning of the forest fire actually burned the cloud away. You see a cloud field, and in the middle where the pollution is, you see no clouds. The actual smoke burned the cloud away, if you want. And in Indonesia, there are some measurements based on satellite uh, analysis suggesting a decrease in precipitation. So what could be the reason. What other effects besides the pollution? Well, it seems like, first of all, we know there is an urban heat island effect, a city which produces a lot of heat due to, uh, first of all, a lot of uh, concrete, a lot of uh, uh, tar in the streets. It absorbs more radiation. It is heated up. It produces sort of a, if you want, a mountain of heat above the city. As a result, this area is warmer than the than the area around, so you get clouds that are formed over the city. There are some cases when the wind aloft is very strong, you can have the pollution and the heat lifted and shifted downwind of the city, and maybe that's what happened in St. Louis, for example, because here the pollution may tend to reduce the precipitation, but the heat will tend to increase it, and the, this, this uh, tug of war seems to maybe that the uh, urban heat island actually was dominating. There was another study that showed that cities like this, a mega city, sometimes because of the friction as the air ru runs over the city, the friction is stronger. As a result, it prevents the air from moving over the city so clearly, and actually it bypasses the city. The, the city is like a barrier, so the air simply moves around it and produces the rain in slightly different places than what you expect. So if you have your rain gauge sitting just behind the, behind the city, you may not measuring in the right place. Maybe you have to go someplace else, or maybe do an integral over the whole area to see what is the effect of the city. So these are some problems that we still do not understand. And I say we may have two opposing processes. One of them, more heat, uh, deeper clouds, and more rain. And more rain po uh, pollution, smaller cloud drops, and less rain. It's a tug of war between those two, maybe. In addition, urban regions have been shown to divert, as I said before. How many? Two minutes? I have time. Okay. No, not, more. not more. Okay. Now, there's another thing. We talk about global warming. Global warming will probably produce bigger deserts. Some regions that are not deserts today may have deserts today, in the future. We know, for example, that uh, uh, Lake Chad, this is one of the biggest sources of dust coming out of Africa, has the ink. The, has decreased. The water has been uh, uh, evaporating or evaporated, and a great deal of dust is able to be released into the atmosphere from this particular area. Well, if dust is going to come into the atmosphere, we have to think about what dust can do also, not only pollution, because sometimes it mixes with pollution, sometimes it's not, and it very often interacts with clouds. How does it affect precipitation? Well, here's an example of uh, two dust storms, one not very heavy one, one in the eastern Mediterranean, one in the western Mediterranean. And here I have an animation of, not animation, sorry, it's actually photographs from satellite showing dust storm coming out of Africa. You can see interacting with clouds here, making the clouds extremely uh, 
productive in, in, in uh, precipitation on the ground. The question is, what makes the clouds precipitate more? Is the meteorology, the fact that you have dry air, dry and warm air coming into the clouds and sort of lifting them, or is it because of the particles in the clouds which make the rain uh, more intense? This is one of the questions we have to answer. One of the aims, by the way, of the Israeli astronaut project, the MADEX project, was to study the effect of dust on clouds in the Mediterranean. And this is an example. This is the path of the Columbia shuttle, and this is the area where we flew with our airplane. And this is a dust storm that started in, in Africa. And you can see within the dust there are very few clouds, but in the place where the dust interacts with this cold front coming out of Europe, we have very, very intense clouds here, and these intense clouds, the day or half a day later, produce flooding in the area of, of Akko. So obviously the, there was, this interaction was very, uh, very important. And we flew through these clouds, and this is just an example. This is a dust particle, which is not very good for producing cloud droplets because it's not soluble. To make a good cloud droplet, the particle has to be soluble. But on top of it, there is a little soluble material. So this particle with a soluble element on it could produce a relatively large cloud drop. And if you have large cloud drops, they are very effective in producing precipitation. So it is possible that many of these clouds that we measure, that we think we have lots of pollution, they may have a little bit. They don't have to have a lot. Our models tell us we don't need a lot of large particles to produce those very heavy precipitation. I'm almost finished. Now what happens here? This is what I showed you before. This is the, the, the effect of pollution on precipitation from a single cloud. But if you add to this cloud some elements of dust, for example here, you see there is an increase. Still, overall, there is a decrease in precipitation. But if you take just be within a certain limits here, you find that the dust coated with some kind of a soluble material will actually increase the amount of rain on the ground. Now, one, can I say one more thing? Uh, so you have biologists here, that's right. <laughs> uh, one more element we have to think about is the bioaerosols. I mean, obviously, uh, particles are being, being transported from place to place. Very often, some of these particles can carry on them certain biological material. Sometimes they are live bacteria. Sometimes they are fungi. Sometimes they can be just fragments of certain biological material. And uh, I just have here a, uh, ah, I know here. this is a, this is something came out of NASA. I'll try to show it again just to, just, I think it's a nice, Okay, basically it tries to show that these bacteria sitting on top of dust particles coming out of Africa, this is animation, don't think it's, li it's live. No. <laughs> uh, eventually can reach uh, distant, uh, distant places like, like Florida. Okay, since there's no time, I will just put the summary here by saying that the effect of pollution on clouds are more clearly understood than what is the effect on precipitation on the ground. It is clear that aerosol pollution affects the amount and spatial temporal distribution of clouds and precipitation. However, because of the complexity, this doesn't want this is a bug there, I think. <laughs> okay, but we don't understand the last link between what's happening between in the cloud to what's happening in the ground. And the dust certainly can have a very important effect on what's happening in clouds. Thank you. Thank you. We still have a few concluding remarks from uh, Professor Pinchas Alper. So be patient. The coffee is out there.
אני מעלה את זה? I think it is difficult to make concluding remarks. You can hear me. So I collected several points that I thought are interesting to summarize this uh, session. Somebody mentioned before Professor Wallace Broker I think this is something that I liked very much. The climate system is an angry beast, and we are poking it with sticks. And uh, I also gave here a translate, my translation to Hebrew, just to give an imagination of what we are about, what about to happen. Where is the laser? This is the laser? No. I once talked with some of the skeptics about climate warming, and he changed his mind. And I asked him what happened. And he said, this is what really was convincing for me. It was shown in different ways, but not in this way. This is the last 400,000 years, temperature anomalies versus uh, carbon dioxide. The glaciation and the deglaciation periods are shown here. The carbon dioxide moves between 180 to 280, and the temperature, this is the oscillation. But we are located somewhere here, and this is the word given by Professor Kutz and the Anthropocene. So this was convincing for a good friend of mine, and I since use it to show, uh, but there are some more other, other convincing. I want to show you now, very shortly, some of the findings related to this area. Is global warming really happening in this area? What do we see? Now, these are comparison of temperature distribution for the eastern Mediterranean at the lowest lower uh, troposphere at eight, about one and a half kilometer, two periods, 48 to 77, and 73 to 2002. And you can see that there are several significant changes in the distribution of temperature. First, there is a higher temperature, which is the mean, the most frequent temperature, but there is also a change in the distribution, the distribution violence. And most important, <coughs> increase in heat waves, increase in the extreme temperature. <coughs> Another phase for the increase of the extreme temperature is when we compare duration of hot spells and cold spells. The red shows periods of above normal temperature, above uh, one standard deviation. This is for the earlier period of 75 to 1948. You can see that the longer, the most frequent one was one day. And we don't see longer periods than eight days, consecutive days. But in the second period, we can see that the frequencies we have some cases of 10, 11 days, 15 days, which, is, which has a very, very significant impact, for example, on agriculture. So heat waves increase, and they are longer. Now, another point for our region, what about rainfall? They have mentioned before that 200 kilometer resolution is not good. Indeed, we have a project which is called the Global Jordan River, in which we used what is called the downscaling, use regional climate models 
Here I'm showing the result with a 50 kilometer interval. Uh, and we have again the control run for 1961-1990 and two different scenarios for the end of the century. And this is the difference in precipitation, recent results that we get from the Global Jordan River. Now, this scenario is the more severe scenario, what is called A2. And this is minus the control run for the main winter months, December, January, and February, and you can see significant decreases. This is the millimeters, which amounts to 10 to 30 percent over North Israel. The different scenario B2 is better, smaller decreases. There is a problem of downscaling. We have the large scale results and we need to downscale and find out what's really happening on such a small basin like the Jordan River, which is uh, very small compared to the scales we are talking about. Doing this dynamical downscaling, we have found an inter one of the interesting results is the number of days of extreme rainfall at a particular station are going to increase significantly. We have observed in 30 years six days above 70 millimeters per day, which is considered a heavy precipitation. Now in the control run, after correcting the bias, we get about the same number. But in the scenarios in the future, we see doubling of the number of heavy rain days very significant impact. Another result, the standard deviation, these are for different stations in Israel, going from the south, Be'er Sheva, to Kfar Giladi, and you can see your four bars in each of the stations. The black bar is the observation for, for the last 30 years. The control run is the blue. The green and the red are the scenarios in the future. What you can see clearly most of the stations show increase in variability, increase in the standard deviation. And we already notice it in recent climate. I want to make one point, one remark, on the problems in climate models. Aerosols is a big problem, but I want to talk, to mention briefly another problem that we have recently shown uh, in a paper in Global Planetary Change, the water and the carbon synergy in the models is not well reproduced. And this was done by several groups, including looking in a, in a medium scale, which is called regional model of 100 km resolution, going down to a canopy scale over a, a vegetation, very small scale. In all the scales we see the problem of water-carbon synergy. I want to show one example that I, in this I'm finishing. Uh, the role of clouds, greenhouse, greenhouse gases, and their interactions in global warming. When we take from the global warming different results as presented by Houghton's book, we can do a factor separation and analyze what is the contribution of greenhouse gases, the clouds, to the temperature, to the global temperature of the Earth. And you can see here that the synergy, which is, which is let me show it in the other figure, the synergy between clouds and greenhouse gases is very, very significant. And we show this in this paper on all the scales, going from the plant scale to the global scale. This is something that needs a lot more of study and learning. And I choose to finish with this. Nobody make a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. This is our hope on uh, finishes his discussion, and I brought a Jewish, uh, it's not an exact translation, but I think 
This is what we really have to remember. לא עליך המלאכה לגמור ולא אתה בן חורין להיבטל ממנה. Thank you.